Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, since 2018, Bonn University pools expertise in sustainability research across faculties in our transdisciplinary research area, innovation and technology for sustainable futures. CTRA organizes a lecture series called Innovation Pathways to Sustainability as a forum for internationally visible academics. We ask speakers to address research opportunities on sustainability in all its dimensions, social, environmental, as well as economic. Speakers are invited to present inventive research in their field of expertise. For today's lecture, I am pleased to present my distinguished colleague and dear friend, Sabine Schlacke. Professor Schlacke, as you can see from her background picture, is teaching public law at Münster University, where she acts as an executive director, both of the Institute for Environmental Law, as well as the Independent Institute for Spatial Planning, the Central Institute for Raumplanung. She has worked in so many different institutions and capacities that I refrain from mentioning them all. Amongst others, she serves on the editorial boards of a couple of prestigious academic journals. She is a member of the steering committee of the German Society for Environmental Law, and she acts as the vice president of the Bremen State Constitution Court. So all in all, she has achieved pretty much everything achievable in a German legal career. Since 2008, Sabine Schlacke has been a member of the Wissenschaftlicher Beirat der Bundesregierung Globale Umweltveränderungen, our National Advisory Council on Global Change. Five years ago, she became its co-chair. Her lecture tonight is based on her work in, in this eminent institution. Sabine, we are honored and pleased to have you here tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, for this very kind introduction and the opportunity to talk to you today about the requirements of a global land transition. So our new flagship report, uh, which we presented to the German federal government uh, is, well, is rethinking land in the Anthropocene from uh, separation to integration. And everything starts with our flagship report in 2011. Already in 2011, the WBGU, so the also called Global Change Council, highlighted land use as one of three main fields which needs a great transformation. The other two fields uh, are the energy system, which must be decarbonized, and urbanization, which should be managed in a sustainable way. It was clear to us that we need to change production and consumption patterns and lifestyles in such a way that, for example, greenhouse gas emissions are minimized or avoided altogether over the coming decades and tipping points in the earth system are prevented. We have tried to understand what a great transformation means by looking at the history of human development. Major transformations occurred in the phases of civilization that were, for example, the Neolithic revolution, in other words, the transition from a hunter gatherer society to an agrarian society and the industrial revolutions, or in other words, the transition from an agrarian to an industrial society. So it was especially Karl Polanyi who described these great transformations. The difference between these historic great transformations with our great transformation needed in the fields of new land use, um, energy system and urbanization is that the historic transformations were uncontrolled transformations. And what we need now 
is a managed great transformation. And uh, that is uh, the point um, where the, our flagship report uh, starts. Um, we have now turned after nine to 10 years uh, after this flagship report, the great transformation, uh, turned our intention, our attention to land use uh, with the present flagship report. And uh, now these are the three, I think, three parts of my lecture. First, I like to describe what we call the trilemma of land use, which provides a systemic view of the current challenges of our management of land. And this, in the second part, I will take a closer look at five value added strategies that can succeed in a better integration of different concerns in land use. In other words, we try to develop synergistics to overcome the trilemma of land use. And thirdly, I will present five transformative governance strategies that can pave the way for a solidarity-based approach to land. So first, what do we call the trilemma of land use? We are currently observing three major global crises. The climate crisis, the food system crisis, and the biodiversity crisis. And all three crises directly related to land use. First, land and climate, the climate crisis. Although the main cause of the climate crisis is the use of fossil fuels, the way we deal with land today is also the source of considerable CO2 emissions. We have to change our methods of land stewardship because we have to adapt to the effects of climate change. And in addition, if we want to limit climate change to well below two degrees or even 1.5 degrees Celsius, we can hardly avoid actively removing the O2 from the atmosphere. So this was one of the results of the 1.5 degrees report of the IPCC in 2018. Yet some of the methods for this purpose under discussion are very land intensive. For example, afforestation or BACs. In other words, bioenergy combined with CO2 capture and storage. And the second crisis, the biodiversity crisis is not discussed as often, but it's just as urgent. There, there are still nearly um, 700 people. Oh, sorry, this was, uh, this was a mistake. Um, so the pressure um, here is um, that uh, humans are causing worldwide mass extinctions um, and uh, the extinction rate today is 100 to 1,000 compared to pre-human times. And the biggest drivers for this biodiversity loss um, are the changes of land use, over-exploitation, and climate change, the pollution caused by human development, and also invasive species. So, uh, and uh, we all know that this is a very, very um, a crucial crisis. And the third crisis is the land and the food crisis. So um, worldwide, we have to um, realize that still nearly 700 million people suffering from hunger and another 1.3 billion people have no access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food, at least no regular access. At the same time, 2 billion 
people worldwide are overweight. Furthermore, the way we produce food is massively detrimental to the environment. For example, as a result of pesticide use, greenhouse gas emissions, or the destruction of ecosystems. Although sufficient food is currently being produced, it's by no means accessible to everyone. It's often unhealthy or generates high environmental costs. The pressure exerted on the land by the food system is expected to increase in the future since the world's population is still growing and many dietary habits require a lot of land. So three crises, each requiring land. In the, the image below, so on the left, we can see how the different demands on the land overuse the land side by side, so exclusively and competing for it. We raise the question how to overcome all these crises and how to overcome the dilemma. The WBGU recommends to integrate uses or keeping land open with multiple goals in mind so that we move from separation to integration. Certainly, there are certain uses or functions that cannot be combined with other uses and functions, but greater integration of different uses and functions such as protection of for example, ecosystem services on the same land can create space for untouched nature elsewhere. How can this transition from competition to integration succeed? How can we mitigate and manage this dilemma? What we first need in our view, is a new concept. It is, in our opinion, the concept of an integrated landscape approach. This is not a new idea. Um, this idea has been proposed in many, in many research projects and by different scholars. <laughs> Landscape in the WBGO's sense means, and it can be seen in the picture here, an area that is characterized by geographical, natural, ecological, and historical characteristics and interactions. So it's more or less characterized by the natural surrounding of a region or a place and precisely not characterized through state imposed borders and regions. And integrative in our sense means using landscapes multifunctionally, multifunctionally and with added value, ensuring participation and reciprocity of stakeholders, establishing a shared framework for monitoring and evaluation, and establishing an adaptive management. For example, reacting to dynamics and non-linear processes. And furthermore, to achieve this and to integrate this integrated landscape approach, we are persuaded that we need five multiple benefit strategies. They can be used to pursue several goals at the same time. It is firstly the ecosystem rest restoration, secondly expansion and upgrading of protected area systems, thirdly, diversified agriculture, 
and changing dietary habits and uh, finally timer-based construction. So the first strategy is ecosystem restoration. It's motivated, motivated by the need to create new CO2 sinks since global CO2 emissions are falling much too slowly. However, both the natural and the technical potential of many of these methods for removing CO2 from the atmosphere is still very uncertain. In other words, we do not know which technologies are able to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. And we do not know a lot about the risks of these new technologies. Some of the methods are very land intensive and also involve the risk that the storage of CO2 might not be permanent. And we therefore recommend that CO2 things should not be treated equally with emission reductions. So this must be um, differentiated, um, but uh, we need, on the other hand, um, separate targets which should be formulated for cutting emissions and for removing CO2. In any case, CO2 emissions must fall rapidly in order to minimize the need for CO2 removal. And this then also makes it possible to focus on ecosystem restoration as a multi-benefit strategy. Ecosystem restoration aims to rehabilitate ecosystem services by returning degraded land to a more natural state. Examples include site-specific reforestation, the revetting of peatlands and the restoration of grassland ecosystems. Ecosystem restoration increases absorption of the O2 by soil and vegetation and leads to a rise in biodiversity. However, food security also benefits for example, because ecosystem services such as the pollination of agricultural land by insects are improved. The biodiversity crisis cannot be overcome without the second strategy. We are proposing the expansion and upgrading of protected areas. Protected areas simultaneously also benefit the climate, since the conservation of ecosystems not only prevents CO2 emissions. Protected area also absorb and store CO2 from the air. Finally, protected areas also offer added value for food security, as they not only protect genetic resources, but can also be compatible with sustainable agriculture. Scientists and policymakers are calling for the expansion of protected area systems to cover 30% of the global land surface as a meaningful target, and we recommend this target as well. Thirdly, only very briefly, it, the third strategy is about agriculture, uh, where we have looked at the European Union and the Sub-Saharan Africa as examples, and the deficits are very obvious. In both regions, soils are degrading for different reasons. In the EU, due to the excessive inputs of pesticides and fertilizers, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, due to insufficient fertilization. Everywhere, there is a trend towards uniformity. Fewer and fewer plant varieties are being grown. The focus in both industrialized and developing countries should be on creating ecologically intensive systems that contribute both to food security and to biodiversity conservation and climate change mitigation. Just two examples. One is uh, agroforestry systems, which combine trees with farming and livestock. And a second example is agrophotovoltaics, with, where solar panels protect fields from too much solar radiation. But uh, for example, in Germany, sometimes the planning law is not allowing such um, multifunctional land use. 
The fourth strategy concerns dietary habits, especially in industrialized countries. The focus should be equally on human health and the conservation of ecosystem services. The high proportion of animal products in people's diet, diets is having a negative effect and impact on both dimensions. Plant-based food requires less area and can thus relieve pressure of the land. And this can be directly linked to the change of values. In Europe, we are already observing a trend. If you look at our children, for example, a trend uh, towards reduced meat consumption. The planetary health diet uh, recently proposed by the Lancet Commission with its high vegetable and no meat content can also point the way forward and should be integrated accordingly into dietary guidelines. But what to do and how to implement these diet, diets, it's, it's, it's difficult. And uh, in our opinion, uh, public canteens, um, also school canteens should be based, um, their menus should base their menus on the, this proposal. And at the same time, however, conditions must be created to ensure that the costs of environmental destruction are increasingly reflected in food prices. So the fifth strategy identifies timber-based constructions as a multiple benefit strategy for a sustainable bioeconomy. In this context, in the context, it's important to bear in mind that biomass is not available in unlimited um, quantities and that priority must be given to food supplies, the conservation of biodiversity and natural carbon reservoirs. So here we have really a competing system. The bioeconomy should focus especially uh, on applications that store biomass and the carbon it contains for, for as long as possible. And uh, building with wood is a good example of this. We propose that Germany's federal government together with international partners should proclaim a mission for sustainable construction. And on the one hand, this is about making sustainable building more attractive and cheaper than conventional building. But on the other hand, care must be taken not to promote deforestation, for example, but ensure that building with wood is embedded in a sustainable wood production. So these are our five multifunctional strategies. And now let's move on the third part of the presentation, the five governance strategy which you see here in this picture. And uh, you know, I'm a lawyer. I feel a little bit more um, um, or better to talk about governance strategy. So you will feel that uh, how I present it. Um, so uh, the five strategies concern change agents, the proactive state, European Union, international cooperation, and new cooperation alliances. Individual actors, especially people and institutions, should, if they are pioneers in sustainable land use, and if they practice new forms of multi-benefit land use, be supported, for example, financially, and not hindered by proper, especially governmental frameworks. So we, we call these pioneers change agents and um, many of these change agents are experimenting with new land-based conservations and use practices. And uh, yesterday I um, presented uh, our flagship report in Dresden um, uh, at a really big symposium, and it was the first time after one year and uh, three months that I uh, gave a lecture um, 
uh, really um, in, in present and not uh, online digital. And so it was a really interesting experience. And there um, I got to know the Olga project. And I thought, well, this is also a pioneer uh, project uh, in our sense. It aims to increase profits by improving the ecological functions of water courses and flood plains. And at the same time, multifunctionally, the cultivation of energy wood along rivers, uh, which should lead to a regional distribution of the products of these um, wood. And another change agent I met in Brazil, a Brazilian NGO, you see here the golden tamarind monkey on this picture. This NGO have managed to prevent the extinction of the golden tamarind monkey by reforesting the Atlantic rainforest in Brazil with the financial support, not of the Brazilian state, but of this, by the support of zoos, all over the world, also German zoos and of other um, NGOs. However, these change agents can only be truly effective if there is a corresponding framework that enables them. So secondly, states are very, very important to implement the five multifunctional strategies. States and not only NGOs should support um, the implementation and also change agents, for example. Um, it's the states that have the power over the global commons of land and soil. It's their territorial power that they exercise. And this must, of course, be exercised in such a way that the land can indeed be used sustainably, sustainably and multifunctionally. States can do this in different ways. On the one hand, they can create incentives, for example, offer support or granting financial subsidies or enabling certifications for products. Um, these are all, I call them indirect instruments. Um, and, uh, but based on our conviction and our analysis, we can also say that incentives and subsidies alone will not be sufficient. Regulations and bans are also needed as direct instruments, for example, prohibitions of unsustainable land use. And besides that, a special emphasis should lie on integrated spatial and landscape planning. And now I come to Germany because there I know the legal framework of landscape planning and spatial planning. In Germany, for example, a further development of spatial and landscape planning in the sense of an integrated landscape approach is necessary in my opinion and in the opinion of the WBGU. At first glance, Spatial planning as supra-local and cross-cutting planning offers very good approaches for an integrated landscape approach. In the following, I will briefly outline possibilities for integrated landscape approaches in spatial planning, landscape planning, and local planning. And first, spatial planning. Although the guiding principle of spatial planning is already sustainable spatial development. Uh, spatial planning predominantly assumes a separation of uses in the land. So in practice, they separate the uses. In contrast to the currently often predominant economic and social interests, for example, industrial plant approval and housing construction, it is necessary, in my opinion, to strengthen the importance of ecosystem services and the value of nature in planning processes. Here, it is necessary to develop planning models in the direction of 
multi-benefit orientation and multifunctional land use that can include that certain concerns such as climate protection should become predominant concerning other concerns and concerning their weight in the process of weighing different interests. The instrument and that we that we can discuss afterwards, the instrument for this is already existing or one instrument with a view to areas that show particular added value in terms of climate change or their ecosystem services, priority areas in German um, Vorranggebiete can be de designated and they can give particular significance in the weighing of subsequent planning station, stages. Secondly, the landscape planning. The landscape plan is intended to pursue the objective of the Nature Conservation Act, the bio biological diversity, the physical functions and intangible functions, and as an overall concept, to balance the interests of use in the municipal, municipal area. It is, in my opinion, the most important instrument to integrate the integrated landscape approach. But landscape plans are losing de facto significance. We only see a low number and a high age of landscape plans. They are currently not effective instruments, although also due to their lack of binding force. Modernization of this instrument is therefore called for. So landscape planning could be further developed as an instrument for strengthening integrated landscape approaches. For this, their binding force and significance for other sectoral planning and cross-sectoral planning would have to be reinvented or re, there should be a rethinking about it. It have, has to be strengthened. Furthermore, they would also need to be more focused on different ecosystem services as they currently tend to locate their focus in nature conservation. So uh, I think through these uh, developments, uh, we get a more important landscape planning and last but not least the local planning since the natural balance is comprehensively considered and controlled in landscape planning, it should be given greater binding uh, and significance in the context of local planning. Well, the third governance strategy um, is a strategy focused on the EU. Um, only two sentences. Um, in this context, the European Wheel is important. And uh, in our uh, view, the common agricultural polity uh, is important. And we recommend to transform, to, yeah, to transform this um, common agricultural um, polity into a common ecosystem policy. And that will, this was mean, would mean that government support would only be provided if the agricultural measure is also ecological. And if we look at the current, um, well, discussing discussions about the gap uh, or the gap, um, I think um, we, are, we will not um, succeed in this uh, dimension or this direction. So uh, there will be a, a more or less um, old version of the gap uh, until or by 2027, up to 2027. Uh, the fourth um, governance strategy um, focus on strengthening and intensifying international cooperation the three so-called Rio conventions have already provided us with good starting points. The first is the framework convention on climate change. The second is the convention of, on bio, 
logical diversity, and the third is the convention to combat desertification. However, each of these conventions looks at land from a sectoral viewpoint, from the angle of climate protection, from the angle of biodiversity, or the prevention of desertification, but they don't develop an overall and systemic concept of sustainable land use transformation. And in this respect, these conventions need to be more closely interlinked. And we do not think that the best way is to um, um, create a new convention. The best way in our view is to do that um, um, by holding a joint conference as soon as possible. An invitation should be extended to what might be called a global land summit, perhaps as early as um, 2022. And in this summit, it in turn um, should pursue two main goals. Um, on the one hand, degraded areas of land should be restored, at least 315 million hectares by 2030, or possibly even more. And on the other hand, the goal should to expand protected area systems to cover the 30% goal of the Earth's surface. And my, uh, I think the most important recommendation on the governance strategy is the fifth one. Uh, in order to strengthen existing international efforts, we recommend that new cooperative alliances are formed by like-minded states or sub-national regions using new forms of multilateral cooperation. And here you see the three models we uh, created. Um, uh, and um, the first one is uh, the model of a regional alliances that uh, regional alliance that implements an integrated landscape approach, even across borders. Think, for example, of Germany and the Netherlands. Regional alliances of subnational regions can, for example, establish regional circular economy and value change chains. Uh, they can further develop existing biosphere reserves into pioneers of integrated landscape spaces or establish regional innovation hubs for sustainable farming methods. Another model, the second one, that are supranational alliances, um, and um, they create cooperative communities um, in the idea of the European Union. So they um, give uh, their power to a supranational institution, um, and especially in the field of land, global land transition. And the difference to the EU is that it is not only um, 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 restricted to, the, to Europe, um, it is all over the planet. So it is a global supranational alliance. And uh, finally, we propose the establishment of global conservation alliances um, for valuable ecosystems, states, but also private actors join forces with the aim of conserving, restoring, and also jointly leasing valuable ecosystems in a particular state. And while the host state contributes ecosystems to the community, other states can contribute maintenance costs. I would like to summarize key messages as follows. A global land use transformation needs systemic interrelations, synergistic interactions from separation to integration, and a solidarity-based assumption of responsibility. Only if our approach to land stewardship changes fundamentally and profoundly Will we succeed in achieving the international climate protection goals? We will be able to halt or perhaps stop altogether the dramatic decline in biodiversity. And we are currently what we are currently experiencing. Thank you for your attention. And um, at the end, 
I would like to conclude with the following appeal. Only if our approach to land changes fundamentally, can climate protection succeed, the dramatic loss of biodiversity be averted, and the global food system be made sustainable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sabine, for a very dense and informative lecture. I couldn't agree more with the outcome. Um, so I am well aware of what is going to, to take place at 6 p.m., but in my opinion, there is still time enough to discuss your lecture and to finish the British afterwards. So please raise your hands in order to ask questions. And Jan Werner is the first one. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and Sabine, was... maybe you should uh, um, stop the, end yes, I the, want, the screen yeah, sharing. The screen sharing, but how to do this uh, neue Freigabe, that's wrong. Uh, okay. Wonderful, perfect. Go so, ahead, Jan. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask, I, I have some interest in, in your expertise on how scientific knowledge about all these matters is transformed into policy and law. And um, what interests me, there, there are two aspects of this. One very concrete one is, um, and I think you mentioned that on some of your slides, uh, sometimes um, it's, it's a legal hurdle um, that is in the way of integrating uh, multiple landscape uses. Um, and you mentioned agroforestry, which is something that um, is in fact uh, facing a legal hurdle in, in Germany and in some other European countries, uh, because um, once you have a tree or a number of tree, trees of a certain age um, on, on your land, um, it may become a forest and then you're not allowed to cut them anymore or use them in any other way. Um, so I assume there are many of those hurdles in the way of doing uh, what you're proposing. Um, and what particularly interests me is how, how law makers or what we call policy makers often deal with uncertainty in this context. So we know there might be more biodiversity um, if we change the landscape structure. We know there might be more carbon sequestration if we do one or the other thing, but exactly how much and what kind uh, uh, of effects um, follow when we do this is subject to uncertainty and depends a lot on where you do it. So um, how sure do we have to be about something that um, might happen if we transform landscapes in one other way and uh, until lawmakers or policy makers um, do consider putting that into, into law? Or is that maybe a stupid question, which is fine um, if it is, um, but it would help us to actually um, work with these topics and formulate our policy recommendations. Well, yes, no, it's not a stupid question <laughs> at all. It's a very intelligent and uh, very important question. Yes, uh, firstly, you are right. Uh, we have these legal hurdles, uh, but um, the WBGU cannot um, well, examine and assess all these legal hurdles in different um, um, legal uh, systems uh, of different states of the world. Yeah, so often we only um, discuss or assess the German system or another European system because uh, um, we, we we can we know that and that. That is very, um, um, it's not so difficult. So uh, yes, we have this. And uh, I, I, I know that uh, for in different uh, ministries, they discuss these uh, legal hurdles in Germany. So this is a point uh, which is already discussed. Uh, I don't know um, even if they um, think about uh, proposals to change, for example, uh, the German um, um, Waldgesetz, so um, Bundeswaldgesetz, um, where we have these uh, requirements you, you described. Um, but um, um, how to handle or how to, um, uh, yeah, how to, um, um, what can we do um, uh, with the uncertainty? So we, we know we need this multifunctional, uh, multifunctional land use. 
uh, but how much you said it already and in which dimension or with which direction we are uncertain. What I would um, recommend is to um, include monitoring uh, and to, um, I, Wolfgang knows my answer already because I say it every, in each conference we have together. And I would also recommend to establish um, um, experimentation clauses so that we can uh, 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 regulation as an experiment, which we monitor and evaluate and assess at the end. Yeah, so that we know uh, what are the effects of this um, stipulation, for example, or the legal changes, and also what are the effects, the impacts of this uh, change of legal requirements. Um, so that would be one, one option um, to handle this uncertainty. And on the other hand, we need more research on it. Yeah, so uh, we need um, 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 uh, projects, uh, research projects, and um, therefore, for example, the uh, BMDF has um, has financially support these uh, these research projects. Uh, um, so this is um, these are two options in my view. Thanks a lot, Sabine. Um, I don't know if I've noticed there are two questions in the chat. The first one by Andre Castro, and almost as fun a fundamentalist one by Bayan. Uh, what is the role of changing the structure of land property rights in order to achieve your model? So I have to read it. Changing the structure of land property rights, yeah. So land property rights, it's, uh, it's also a very important element of uh, land use uh, and the legal framework uh, of land use. Um, I must admit that we have not evaluated the different Property, land property rights uh, in different countries, because this is depending on the uh, law of the of each state. Uh, um, what for um, right, right of property do they have? What are the specific requirements? Um, uh, but uh, what what I uh, can say is um, we have in, in many, many countries, we do not have um, property rights um, like in Germany. They are not um, really um, protected by the state um, so that uh, there is uncertainty. And um, the other question doesn't seem credible that the private incentive. Well, perhaps um, Andre Castro can uh, precise a little bit uh, his um, question if he likes. Um, what else? Um... Well, he is present. Yeah. Yeah, Andre. So um, my question is that, um, I mean, all you said that needs to be done makes a lot of sense to me. My main point is that I don't see, because ma the majority of, I'm assuming the majority of land is somehow privately owned or privately leased. So I don't see how this can be in the interests of the landowners. It can be of the interest yes. of some of them, but not yeah. always and not all of them. So yes. that's the main problem. That's the main problem. You're totally right. That's the main problem, especially if you um, reflect our last um, um, proposal, a global conservation um, alliance. This is not, that's, that's only uh, possible to implement if the states have the power to, um, yes, uh, um, uh, to buy or to um, have the right on the land, yeah. And, um, uh, I think what we need is small financial support. So it is one instrument to give money to the landowners. Yeah, so that is the way, or often the way 
we do it in Germany, for example, if we think uh, um, of um, uh, agriculture, for example, so that um, the, um, the land is um, uh, used in an extensive way um, in the sense of agriculture, um, there we, we pay for it. Um, that is one option. Uh, on the other hand, an other option could be um, to um, forbid uh, a special land use. So this is the right of the state. Um, and um, to buy more land. I think for protected areas, it is really um, um, uh, required to buy land. And that's the role of the state. So in my opinion, the state has a crucial and um, important role in this sense. And there is another question from Laila. Perhaps Laila is with us and can uh, raise. Um, she asks, how do you assess uh, the current uh, EU renaturation targets in its biodiversity strategy of 230? Is it achievable um, for Germany? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the current uh, uh, renaturation target um, I'm not sure if uh, it is, I, I don't know exactly uh, the target um, now. Yeah, I should know, but uh, in this moment, I do not know. So I can't say if it is achievable for Germany. So I have to look it up, I must, I must say. Sorry yeah. for this non-answer. <laughs> no problem. Um... Please allow me to, to ask a question myself, which refers to the last part of your presentation. Um, what you suggested tonight basically requires global action. And in order to achieve this global action, you, you asked for proactive state activities and suggested uh, cooperation alliances. You didn't even mention international institutions and the United Nations in particular. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of ecological institutions such as UNEP, but in particular of the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, an integrated landscape approach without FAO involvement doesn't sound very realistic to me. So how are your perspectives to promote sustainable land use within the United Nations? Well, uh, this is a, you are also right. Um, this is a task of the United Nations, firstly. Um, and I, I think we do not left beside the United Nations. So the three Rio conventions are all United Nations conventions. And uh, I think uh, if we want uh, that they um, are better coordinated in the sense of land use, sustainable land use, uh, the United Nations has uh, to um, initiate has to initiate this. This is uh, the first answer. And the second, uh, it is right, there are um, different organizations and programs. Um, um, for example, you mentioned UNEP. Um, UNEP is not very strong in this uh, sense of land use and integrated land use approaches. Um, uh, and I um, have to admit um, for the food and agricultural um, organization, we, we had a, well an analyze of the global studies that we do in every or before every flagship report, we analyze the global studies of different uh, organizations like uh, um, Food and Agriculture, UNEP, uh, UN Habitat and so on. Um, but um, the result was uh, that um, the focus uh, lies on food and agriculture, but not on these multifunctional approaches. Yeah. So um, while well, they also speak about climate change, but only in the sense of uh, how does this um, um, uh, concern, um, uh, for example, uh, the food security. Uh, yeah. So um, 
if my answer is um, there is a lot to do <laughs> and uh, we do not have this uh, view and uh, what I would say all our results, all, all our recommendations are not new. They are not, uh, they are all discussed in um, research papers and so on. But what the WBGU does with this flag which, flagship report is to set the frame and to, to set the topic. So this topic is important. And um, I think this is our function. And um, so FRO and other programs, they are not very effective and strong in this sense. Thanks a lot, Sabine. We have a next question by Jorge Silar, who, according to his name, seems to be neither German nor British. And I'd suggest we make this the last question for obvious reasons. Mr. Silar. Uh, yeah, thank you. So I, I wrote in the chat, but I might as well just ask uh, in person. That's, uh, nice. that's nice. Yeah, that's better yeah. for me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, so my question is related to this concept of bioeconomy and circular economy that you mentioned a few times in your presentation, right? And I think that uh, this concept, uh, they, they imply some substantial transformations in our global value chains and food systems and how goods and services are produced. And these transformations might uh, lead to a complete reorganization of some of these value chains and consequently uh, who exactly benefits right from these value chains. Uh, so there might be some changes on who exactly is benefiting or how much uh, different actors are benefiting. So basically my question is if on the one hand, the adoption of this concept or adoption of these new technologies associated with this concept might be beneficial from an environmental standpoint, they might come at the cost from maybe marginalized actors in uh, global value chains. So do you think we should be considering some sort of uh, regulations already to ensure that uh, these transformations will not lead to more inequality uh, in, in our societies? Uh, both in developed countries, but especially in developing uh, countries where most of this biomass is being produced. Yes, thank you for this question. Yes, I, I think we should um, uh, rethink our regulations. Um, and um, one um, idea could be uh, the Due Diligence Act of, uh, yes, it's an example of German legislation, um, to have this not only for human rights, but also for um, environmental uh, aspects, yeah? So this is uh, one element I think we, we have to change. And if we talk about circular economy, uh, we cannot only talk about this in Germany or in the European Union. We have to talk globally about this. If we uh, really um, think that this is a, um, an important topic. So um, I think um, uh, all these um, yeah, instruments you mentioned, um, we have to discuss globally. And um, this is, um, this is um, very difficult because what is, what is the linking po point on the um, multilateral level? And uh, what, we, um, what we proposed, what we suggested is uh, to talk about this in these um, um, uh, cooperation alliances. So that there could be uh, supranational alliances, uh, there could be supranational alliances establishing a circular economy, establishing a due diligence act, for example. Um, and um, then all the member states are binded by these regulations that could be a model then for other regions or for other states of the world. Maybe that could be an answer. Not a sufficient, but one. Any other questions left? Yeah, the match is if, starting now. If not so, I don't intend to extend this too long for obvious reasons. <laughs> Sabine, thank you very much for having been here tonight for an inspiring lecture and discussion. 
and also best for you and your institution. Um, on behalf of TRA6, I would like to say thank you to, to everybody here for having joined your lecture tonight and having enriched our discussion. Our next lecture will take place on August 26th. The speaker will be Julia Steinberger from Lausanne University. Now, a nice evening to everybody. And if you like, so enjoy the match. Thank you so much. Good night.